Hey YouTube, it's Jay. And today we're going to talk about uh, the risks of missing a ball and how the, the, the part that equipment plays in that risk and how to mitigate those risks. Okay, so let's start with the very obvious size of the pocket. Okay, um, now size of the pocket, we hear people talking about tight pockets and tight tables. One of the really misunderstood things about size of the pocket and how tight the pocket is, is that it's about all about accuracy. Now it is true that you have to be more deliberate with smaller pockets. Okay, if I'm shooting into a five inch pocket um, versus a four inch pocket, and by the way, pockets are measured at points, not at the throat, so points. Um, if I'm shooting at a four inch pocket, I have to take just a little bit of extra care to make sure my stroke is great and that everything I'm doing works. Um, but the reason, the real reason that tighter pockets are harder to play on is because you can't cheat the pocket. Okay, so we've talked about cheating the pockets, the idea that, and we haven't really gone into it yet, but the idea is that if I have a nearly straight in shot or if I want to change the angle that the cue is going into the rail, I can choose to shoot that off center, right? Off center left, off center right. If I, if I need the cue ball to go more to the right, I cut it off, I cut the ball to the left half of the pocket. Okay, so cheating the pocket. Um, with five inch pockets, you have great latitude. You can actually get a, a pretty big angle just by cheating the pocket on a straight in shot. Um, on a four inch pocket, not so much. There's not as much pocket to cheat, which means that the angles that you can create are smaller. Okay, so smaller pockets Yes, you have to be a little bit more deliberate with your accuracy, but the big thing about smaller pockets is that you can't cheat the pocket as much, so you can't create the angles. Um, all right, so that's the only, I, I'm not really gonna go into the pockets that much. I am going to talk about the pocket angle, okay? Uh, so on a Brunswick from the factory, the pocket angle is 51 degrees. Um, both ang the, the angle here is a 51 degree angle, okay? On a diamond, that angle is closer to 45. It's not quite 45, but it's closer. So what that means is that when you shoot down the rails on a diamond, there's a lot of help to get the ball into the pocket, and they make up for that help by making the shelf deeper, okay? The distance from the pocket, the, the, the inside of the opening is bigger, uh, which means that if you hit down and it bounces back and forth, it's not going to fall in as easily as the, the Brunswick does. Um, on the other hand, the Brunswick, if you hit it hard down the rail, uh, if you have a shot like, say, this, and you need to draw back to the other end, you have to be perfectly inside the pocket. Otherwise, this ball rejects outwards away from the pocket where the diamond will reject into the interior. So the diamond will tend to hang more where the Brunswick will tend to reject the ball more. Okay, so um, you can use what's called helper English, uh, which means that like on this shot, I would put left hand English on the cue ball, which would cause it to spin clockwise. It would transfer some of that spin to the one ball, causing it to spin counterclockwise, which means that it's spinning towards the pocket. And if it hits that edge, it helps it to fall in. However, helper English will get you in trouble. Um, it's English. That means it's throwing the, the balls, uh, and it's very easy to overspin it, and we're gonna talk about that one in the next video. But uh, the short version is helper English. Um, I don't use it. Uh, if I need to make a shot uh, with English for the leave, 
then I'm incidentally getting helper English, but I'm not deliberately putting English to help it in the pocket unless I'm wanting to throw it. And, and that's the only time I deliberately put English to help into the pocket. Okay, uh, so let's talk about these rails. Okay, so rails play differently. Um, these are Artemis rails, and you can tell that pretty easily. Um, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but I'll take a picture of it and show you. But down the rail on the top, there's a little crest, and you can feel it, okay? that crest causes it to pick up dirt. So you'll see a line of dirt on a table that, that needs, uh, that's been used for a while um, that runs down the center of the rail on Artemis rail. So that does not exist on super speed rails. Super speed rails are curved. There's no, no crest that's picking up dirt. And that dirt comes from your shaft of your cube, by the way. Um, so, <clears throat> on the top of Artemis rails, there are, t it, unless they've been sanded down, which some installers do, and I actually prefer, I wish that they had sanded these, um, but that line, basically the rail comes straight across to midway and then it dips down as opposed to Brunswick rails, which are more just a gentle curve down, okay? So on Artemis rails, you'll see a line, and that's how you tell it's an Artemis rail. Why do we need to know that? Because Artemis rails play shorter, and they also tend to be grabby. And what I mean by grabby is that um, they're a softer rubber than super speed rails, which is the Brunswick rail. They're softer. So the ball will tend to sink in easier, which means that if you watch my rail video, you'll know that, that that creates a little ridge here, which tends to pop the ball away from the rail. So Brunswick rails uh, versus Artemis rails. The Artemis rails will play shorter, um, and, they, and a ball down the rail will tend to come in, and if you hit it with any speed at all, it'll sink into the rail just a bit, which causes it to spring out. Uh, a way where, where a Brunswick rail, you can hit fairly firmly down the rail and it won't do that. It'll, it'll skip off the rail and go in the pocket. Okay, um, so you might miss because you hit a little too hard and it's Artemis rails. What, what I'm saying is that if you see that little ridge, or you can feel it, it you can definitely feel this ridge, okay? Um, if you see or feel that ridge, they are Artemis rails. When you shoot shots down the rail, you want to shoot them softer. You, uh, or you want to be extremely accurate and make sure you hit the center of your pocket. Um, by the way, diamond ra the, the rails on diamond tables are also uh, Artemis rails. Um, they, they play shorter. They bounce a lot because, of, because they're softer. Um, you won't... You, so from the factory, you won't see that ridge on a diamond table. Not, not often. Um, occasionally, one will be installed badly. But uh, for the most part, you won't see it because they sand them down when they send them with the table. So they come already pre-sanded. Uh, so when you watch crows play, you will quite often see them, when they're getting ready for a shot, they'll do this, okay? There are two things that they are looking for here. One is they're looking for the feel of the shaft, um, which we're not concerned about right now. We'll talk about that someday. But they're also checking to make sure the joint hasn't come loose. Uh, you will find that um, if you have a unilock joint, they tend to come loose. Okay? Um, most of them will come loose occasionally. Uh, and it does it randomly, it's not every shot, uh, but joints like mine that have the actual, you know, the, 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 the typical standard joint with a pin uh, in the butt going into the shaft, um, these come loose occasionally too. So uh, if you watch, every now and then you'll see me when I'm getting ready for a shot, I'll just twist it a little. And I don't know if you can tell I'm doing it, but I'm twisting that, right? 
when I go to break, I always twist it tight. Um, a loose shaft can cause you to miscue. It can cause you to have a bad uh, a, a a bad contact with the cue ball. Uh, it can also cause you to hit it at a speed you didn't expect, uh, much lower than what you expected, because some of the energy of the shot is transferred into the into side to side movement of the shaft. So. Um, Always, when you're getting ready to play, tighten it as, as tight as you can get it. Um, and then during the game, get in the habit of either checking by just when you pick up your cue to go to a shot. By the way, they come loose from setting them in thing, setting them in cue holders, uh, and like the claw or chairs that have... Uh, <clears throat> cutouts for the cue, things like that. That's how they come loose. Uh, so get in the habit of the first time you pick up your cue for your inning, just either give it a quick twist to make sure it's tight, or get in the habit of doing the pro thing, which is to uh, stroke. Basically, you're stroking up in the air. Um, the other part of that, when, when I say feel, what I'm talking about is distance between the hand and the bridge. So they're, they're getting their distance here. Um, and a lot of players will have markers on their cue for where their hand position goes. Um, some, some will use a band of tape. Uh, some will use um, features of the cue. Like you'll, I, I use this back ridge on between the wrap and the and the and the uh, butt on my normal shot my little my, my ring finger is on my wrap and my pinky is on the uh, finished portion of the cue um, and you'll see me occasionally uh, and I do this a lot um, I use kind of a slip stroke style of getting ready I'll, I'll start out with my hand in the middle of the cue but you'll see me when I'm doing my warm-up strokes and I'm too far up slide my hand grab on with my bridge you know, I'll grab with the bridge and I'll slide this hand and then I'll continue my warm-up strokes. Um, you'll see that mostly when I'm doing rail shots because on rail shots I tend to choke up unintentionally and I feel that I'm all the way on the wrap so I'll slide my hand back till I'm off the wrap. Um, and we can talk about that during the next one too. Uh, so anyhow, um, so making sure your shaft is tight, really important. Okay, let's talk miscues, okay? And when I say miscue, I'm talking about the tip sliding off on contact with the cue ball, okay? We miscue a lot more than you think we do, okay? Um, you have little tiny miscues that happen on virtually every shot. That's what makes your consistency on the shot a little less. Some players will use soft tips uh, to reduce this. Uh, most of the players I know are shooting either medium or hard tips. Uh, I shoot a medium tip. Um, the There are a few things that you can do with a hard tip that you can't do with a soft tip. Uh, Q jumps is one of them. Uh, so uh, anyhow, um, so there are a lot of little tiny miscues that happen. Not, not all of them are going to be that type of miscue, okay? In fact, I did miscue on that shot, but you didn't hear the, the clack that you know, normally associate with it. You didn't hear any of the noise. The cue ball looked like I just missed, um, but actually that was a miscue. Um, and, and what's happening is that your tip is glazed. So you're not going to, not all miscues look like that. Okay, that was a, that was a, what we normally associate with a miscue. But you can miscue without that happening. You can miscue like I did with that ball just a minute ago, where it looks like I just missed, but the, but I actually miscued. A um, couple of things to help mitigate miscues. Okay, so 
there are two types of miscues. There's an equipment miscue, and then there's a miscue caused by your stroke. Okay, so this last miscue was miscued by stroke. You, you saw I didn't get down, I didn't aim, I didn't follow through. Um, and I, I think I steered the ball on top of it just to make it miscue. Um, so there are a few things you can do to mitigate miscues. Number one, make sure your tip is the appropriate length. So layered tips are very tall when they come and they're brand new. Even after you shape them, they're about a quarter of an inch tall. There's too much tip on there. When they're tall like that, they actually are prone to miscue. Um, they're also prone to hit differently than they should. Uh, on a layered tip, you should usually take off about the first two or three layers. Okay? Um, you don't want that tall tip. Uh, it, it's, it's actually... Um, something that you'll see experienced uh, cue repair people do. Uh, and if you ever look at a pro's tip, when they go to a tournament, so before a tournament, a pro replaces their tip, okay? Um, before a major tournament, not necessarily like a little weekly thing or not, not a, uh, you know, not like a regional event, but if you go to the U.S. Open, Virtually every pro has replaced their tip about a week before the open. Okay? But if you look at their tips, they don't look brand new because they've cut off the top. You know, it's, it's about the top third of the tip gets taken completely off. Here's a good example. You want a tip that has enough space between the ferrule and the tip that you're protecting the ferrule and that the tip can give a little bit when you're shooting. But you don't want to have it sticking up way up tall. This is about as much tip as you want to have. This one's actually freshly replaced. Um, and I did the work on that. Um, <clears throat> so this is about what you want. You don't want that big giant tip. If your tip is sticking off the cue by a quarter of an inch after it's been shaped, it's probably wrong, okay? Um, so you want to take off, take off about a third of the tip. You don't want the big tall tip. You want about a, about two thirds of what the new tip looks like. Um, and before each match, you want to scuff it. Okay. So you have, to, so you want the tip to be um, the appropriate height after it's shaped, right? And whether you like nickel or dime, I happen to like nickel. Um, I feel like it gives me more purchase on the ball. Some people feel like dime does a better job of letting them be pinpoint on their English. Whatever, whatever floats your boat. It, whatever you like, whatever shape works for you is good. Okay, I prefer nickel. So once it's been shaped though, before each match, you should scuff it. And I'm talking about if you're doing a, a tournament, um, you should scuff before each match. Now, a lot of people get this wrong. A lot of people get shapers and they will sit there and grind it in um, to, to scuff. You know, and they'll, they'll sit there and they'll do something like, they'll take it and stick it on there and like they're drilling a piece of chalk. We don't want to drill chalk, right? What do we do with chalk? We wipe it across the, across the cube, right? We don't drill in the chalk, we take the chalk and we brush it across. Well, we want to do the same thing with the scuffer. And, and I like the, uh, the bow tie from Q-Tech. Um, I use several different types of scuffers and shapers. I use a Willard's, um, I use a Q-Cube, and I use the Q-Tech uh, bow tie. The Q-Tech bow tie, the reason I use it is because I have problems with my hands, as you know, uh, and this is big enough for me to grab it and brush it across. Okay, so I, I literally sit here and I twist the cue and I brush this across the outside edge, then I move it up a little, and then I do the center, and at the end when I'm done, and by the way, I just finished, I, this is actually freshly scuffed now. 
If you look at that now, it's scuffed all the way around and across the top. I didn't take any leather off of it. All I did is use the scuffer to pick the leather up, to take the leather and, and basically scrape the leather. In a pinch, you can do that with, you can do the same thing with a key. You can take your car key and scrape it across and do the same thing. Um, all we're trying to do is create texture on the top of the tip. We don't want the tip to be flat. Shapers will take leather off of the tip. So like I use a Willard shaper to get my initial shape. Okay, to get my initial nickel shape. I, I don't actually use the shaper on the Q-Tech. I use Willard's. It's the same Willard shaper that I've been using for 30 years, 20 years at least, 30 years, yeah, 30 years. I've been using the, the Willard shaper to get my shape. It's got a nice gauge on it. It makes it easy to see that it's, if, if the tip is completely shaped or not. But when it comes to scuffing, I use either the Q-Tech bow tie or I use the uh, Q-Cube, uh, both of which allow me to brush across the tip and pick the leather up without taking leather off of the tip. Okay, that's how you shape. That will reduce your, your, mis your um, chance of a miscue. All right, what else equipment-wise? Well, one more big thing to talk about with equipment, skids. Okay, what is a skid? So, um, a skid is when, and, and I don't know why they call them skids because that's kind of an inaccurate description of it, but that's what they've been called forever, so that's what we call them. Um, but basically, it's when the, the cue ball has more friction on contact than it normally has. Um, and it happens for a lot of reasons, um, some of which are still unknown, okay? Um, I've, you, you'll occasionally hear Earl talk about them saying, you know, nobody knows why, why balls skid. Well, there are some reasons that we do know about, one of which is if you have a dirty set of balls, God, that sounds wrong. Um, if you have a, if, if the balls are dirty, they will tend to stick to each other for a millisecond when they make contact but as a result if I'm shooting this way and I'm going to cut it in and I make contact at the right point but the cue ball sticks to that for just a moment it throws it short okay um, so the shots that should go in that don't go in were probably skids um, most of the time you can tell a skid because the object ball will bounce up a little bit when it makes contact or the cue ball will. one of the two will bounce up a little on contact because it's grabbing and, and pulling it up from top English will make the cue ball jump bottom English will make the object ball jump it's because it's stuck sometimes there's a spot of chalk on there more often in the pro side what it is is that the balls have little microscopic um, scratches in them and two scratches will just happen to line a scratch on the cue ball will happen to line up just right with a scratch, scratch on the object ball and poof you've got a skid. Um, skids always always cause undercuts okay a skid never causes you to overcut the ball it always causes an undercut so um, there's, there's a video right now on YouTube going around of, uh, I think it's Zelensky, missing a straight-in nine ball, uh, which ultimately, it's either Zelensky, that, is it Zelensky? It's Zelensky versus Filler, uh, and one of them misses a straight-in nine ball. I'm pretty sure it's Zelensky misses a straight-in nine ball. Um, that's like this, and he misses it. That was a skid, okay? That wasn't a miss. That was a skid. If we go back and, and if you were to go back and look at it, he hit it just fine to make the ball, but he ended up undercutting and hitting the rail way up here. Okay? That was a skid. Uh, they happened to all of us. Uh, it's, and when you see it at the pro level, the reason it happens is because of their rules around the balls. 
by rule, the WPA says you must clean with soap and water. Okay? Uh, they allow the use of cleaners, but if you use a cleaner, like the like I use the Chemtech, some people use the Aramith there or the Brunswick clean cleaners, um, those have wax in them. And the wax fills in those scratches. Well, the WPA rule says if you use one of those cleaners on a set so that you get the nice sparkly clean uh, cue ball, uh, you have to use a mixture of water and alcohol to strip the wax off. It cannot be left. Um, and so what that does is that takes the wax out of the scratches. That's one of the reasons you don't see pros slow rolling balls. So when, uh, when we talk about how to mitigate skids, a slow shot where you're rolling the ball into the pocket is subject to skids, okay? If you hit it firm, the same shot, hit it firm, now it won't skid, okay? The, uh, it can skid, but the chances of it skidding on a hard shot are much, much less than if you shoot soft. If you shoot soft, the contact is slightly longer, which lets, gives it an opportunity for those scratches to run, in, those micro scratches to run into each other. So that's one of the reasons pros shoot hard, less prone to skid. One of the reasons that they shoot and try to leave almost straight in shots every time is because skids happen more on thin cuts. Or let me, let me rephrase that. On a thin cut, it's not that the skid happens more, it's that the skid has greater effect. So if this was the skid, I would have missed it. Okay. If I shoot that harder from a straighter angle, even if I do get a skid, it's skidding in the direct, it, it skids in the direction of the, the cue ball's travel. Well, if the cue ball's traveling this way, and there's only a slight angle, that skid's going to affect it less. So the two things to mitigate skids, uh, well, so up front, first thing to mitigate skid, clean balls. Uh, and if they're an older set, use a cleaner that has a wax like, um, or a polish, they, they call it polish, but it's wax, uh, like the Aramith cleaner. I use Chemtech on mine, um, and then uh, Brunswick has a cleaner. There's, there's a bunch of them out there, but use one that is a cleaner and polish because that will fill in those micro grooves. Um, and those are, it's completely legal to do that for every uh, event except WPA sanctioned, uh, as far as I know. So, um, so cleaner and polish. Next, shoot with authority. Don't don't roll balls because you stand a bigger chance of skidding. And three, try to shoot shallower angles. The shallower the angle is, the less effect the skid will have on the ball if it does skid. Okay. So one more thing for you. Shoes. Somebody's laughing right now when, because I'm about to tell you your shoes make a difference. If your shoes slide on the surface you're standing on, it will cause you to be, even if you're in a good normal stance that you use all the time, it will cause you to be slightly off balance, which can throw your uh, which can throw your stroke off, it can also throw speed off, and all kinds of things. So, um, if you're going to be playing in tournaments at an unknown location where you don't know what the flooring is like, get a set of restaurant shoes. Okay? That's what, that's what these black ones that I have, that's what these guys are. These are restaurant shoes, they're non-skid soles. Um, and they do just fine everywhere. Now, if you know the place has carpet, then you don't need to worry about shoes. Whatever shoes will work because the carpet's not going to be slippery, we hope. Um, but I, there's, there's actually a pretty famous match uh, where um, Earl was playing... Who was he playing? He might have been playing Ephraim. 
in the match. But for decoration, they put this stainless steel design on the ground around the table. And when he was standing on the stainless steel, his feet were sliding. And so he actually asked Johnny Archer to go run back to the hotel room. They were sharing a room. Uh, to run back to the hotel room and grab a different pair of shoes with a non-skid sole. And he changed shoes in the middle of the match. He did that because his footing was uncertain. Well, um, if you keep your, if, if you don't know what the flooring's like at the place you're going, or if you know that it's something like this, this wood, let me tell you what, this is an old wood floor, um, and it's, it's slippery. Uh, I have a, so if you go back in the older videos, you'll see me wearing a pair of black Nikes. Uh, and then I stopped wearing them and I switched to kind of a camouflage set of Skechers. Um, that's because the Nikes were slipping on this floor. Uh, and that's why I stopped wearing them when I shot. And then there were, uh, and then the Skechers, they do a great job of holding, but uh, I went to go play in a tournament. Uh, the, the Albany Open, which I wasn't sure of the dress code for, and many of the uh, pro, t pro and open events have a rule about wearing black shoes. So I had to buy a pair of shoes. Uh, so I got the restaurant shoes. Let me tell you what, makes a difference. You wouldn't believe how much it makes a difference. Wear the right shoes, uh, ones that are non-slip, non-skid, um, and it will actually make you more accurate, make you miss less balls. Not more accurate, but it'll make you miss less balls. Anyhow, that's all I've got for today. Hope you like what you saw. If you like it, hit like, hit subscribe, ding the notification bell, and we'll see you next time.